It's always a privilege to come back to Purdue, and especially in terms of a 100th anniversary. Um, J.J. Davis started the entomology department here. I had the privilege when I was a student to spend at least four hours a week with him for about a year and a half before he passed away and go over all the history and everything. So uh, I'm kind of a living piece of what really occurred. And uh, when they had the 75th anniversary of, for the Purdue Pest Control Conference, they had asked me to do the history at that time. This one is gonna be uh, a little bit uh, different. And uh, the first thing is I gotta get your mind in the correct state of mind. So I've asked somebody to come up here and help me and to pass out uh, paper. And you be so you're close together, but everybody gets a piece of paper. And you can pass those all the way in the back. You could start. These are crayons. Everybody gets a crayon. You pick a color. Paper's the same. That's why I couldn't have you spread all over, okay? So it don't matter if you're a professor or student, TA, everybody gets the crayons and the paper. Raise your hand if you don't have a crayon yet. Oh, a whole row there. It's You don't have to smell it. You just take one and pass it down. Okay, now what happens is when you start, usually by the first grade, although today the kids are learning so early with preschool and pre-kindergarten, it may be even in preschool. You get a pencil or a crayon and you get a piece of paper like this, and the first thing I want you to do, this line is too big. I want you to cut the line in half. So remember you used to have capital and small letters? So you go laterally across. So now you only got a teeny bit. And now what I want you to do is take your crayon and write little circles like you're learning to write O's. Just go in out that little, don't go out of that line. Stay in that line. This is what they teach you. Stay in this line. All right, now, they, it's like the military. They have to get you to think what the teachers want you to think and, and to stay in that line. Okay, now what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a blank piece of paper and I want you to use a little freedom and scribble all over it. Just scribble all over it. Open your mind a little bit. Make whatever you want on there. It don't have to be a drawing, just joy. Okay, now, you know, a little kid just says, yeah, don't go off. Not one of you went off on the table. All right, now I'm going to give you more paper, and I want you to put this under the paper, and I want you to go off the original paper there and just go on the other paper. Yeah, not bad picture. <laughs> All right. Everybody done that? Okay, now we're going to take the next step. I want you to take your crayon and write on the person's paper next to you. Just draw on it. Reach over and just don't matter anybody's. No, no, Gary. Just keep your own paper. Oh, oh, you first get in the big paper. And, and draw. While you're sitting here, draw on his paper. Oh, draw on his paper? Yeah, draw on his paper. 
You can tell the professors can't think here. It's oh, it's okay. All right, now, <laughs> the next thing I want you to do is to stand up, take the crayon, and wave it in the air. Draw it in imaginary air. Say, All right. Say again. Draw, get, stand up and draw in imaginary air. All right. Now, you can sit down. Now you got your, I got your mind in a frame to be ready to what I'm going to cover. And the crayon, you can take home. I want you to put it on your desk. And every time you start getting in a box where you're thinking just like this, look at the crayon. And remember how you were trained to do little circle, little circles, and that. So let me explain a couple things. Einstein, you heard of him, old Albert? His three greatest theories came when he did not work at a university. He worked for the post office because nobody would give him a job. And I personally believe that the reason he was able to do that, and many other people do this, he wasn't stymied by administration, this paperwork, that paperwork, he could think. Thoreau left Cornell when he was a freshman, bored with English, went out and did his own thing. We used, I was a student, I had to read his book, I remember. I was at Cornell, I was pretty good. They, guy leaves, can't stand the university, and we have to read his book, which says at least they're, they're uh, open-minded. Ben Franklin never finished college. I don't even know if he started college. And so what I'm telling you this is, students, listen, you have a responsibility to go beyond your teachers, beyond your professors. Otherwise, the world goes backwards. Just think if, if all that Gary Bennett knew and Mike knew was what their professors knew, he, they wouldn't remember 100% of it, and then the next one, you follow? So the students have to go further. Some of my students have gone way past me. I, Bobby Corrigan is a rodent expert. Uh, he, I went to a seminar he gave about a year ago. Uh, about 50% of the seminar was totally contradictory to what I taught him because he disproved it. But at the time when I was teaching it, I thought it was right. And on my experience. You follow? So, so that's, that's one thing, uh, is to do that. Now, the faculty have the responsibility to learn from their former students. You cannot just stay in here, this university. You have to go out and see what they're doing and talk to them. I talk to former students at least six former students every week. Every week. Find out what's going on. And I still ask them things like, what didn't you learn when you were here that I should have taught you? And I haven't taught formally since 1980. That's a lot of years, okay? So, and, and this is a good university because they're tight departments. I remember John Osmond used to have everybody at his house to, to start with, and, uh, and he got that from somebody else, I found out, from years before. Uh, so it's, it's uh, pretty neat. Now, um, I'm just going to take a teeny bit of, on my background, but where I came from and so forth. I started in a one-room schoolhouse, literally, okay? And you read this certain book, and then when you finished the book, you just moved up a, a seat. And that, so you went from first grade to second grade. And a third grade biggie, you went across the row. You, you, there's only two rows, okay, in the whole, in the whole thing. And the, the biggest kid in the class was the dumbest kid in the class, and I shouldn't say that, but he had rheumatic fever and he was left back, and he had to be because he could chop the wood for the fire, otherwise we'd freeze to death, the teacher couldn't, couldn't chop. We had our house, uh, our early pest control was a stick to stick in there to move the black widow spiders out of the way, so you sat down, you didn't get bit where it was sensitive, okay. Uh, I grew up on a chicken farm, I scooped rats with a shovel like this, or, you know, kill them like that. Uh, my uncle brought home a screen after World War II, 
and we didn't have flies all of a sudden in the house. That was amazing. This, this screen uh, was, you know, involved with pest control before I knew it. Now, uh, I did a, a little bit of livestock entomology at, at uh, Cornell. I got my master's degree there. And uh, I work with cow manure and urine and, uh, and cows. And, uh, and then I left there and I came to Purdue. And the reason I came to Purdue is because I couldn't get what I wanted at Cornell. Because they looked at urban entomology as not professional, as being um, worse than not professional. Crooks, exterminators, all right? And Cornell was upstate ag school, and most of the pest control people were in New York City, and there was that resentment, you know. Besides, my professors were great in the livestock etymology, and I learned a lot, but it, it was at a time where I, I came to Purdue for urban etymology. So uh, I'm here, I'm here maybe two days, day and a half, and Dr. Rosman says, you're going to New Carlisle, Indiana for 17 days, and, and I got to stand in a field. I said, what does this have to do with urban entomology? And I was standing with glass on either hand, and another student there, about 40 yards away, another one there, and here comes an airplane. Did you ever see that movie where the airplane comes down through the field? Okay, and, and here it comes. And the professor runs and hides in a truck. <laughs> so the, I go like this, and it, and it goes over us, and nothing happened. And then he gets out of the truck, takes this thing off, glass, and he says, okay, go in there and go take a shower now. And he tells me, I said, it didn't work. <laughs> You're gonna come back? No, he says, one ounce of material. It's a new machine called ULV. And it was for the cereal leaf beetle. So the first thing, I come to urban entomology and they got me in cereal leaf beetle out there. And one of the things you're going to do, even in life when you get a job, I, want, I left here to teach urban entomology. They gave me a class of 144 students for botany. Luckily, I had some botany and I could stay, you know, a little bit uh, ahead of them. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit with uh, uh, some slides, some of the history of urban entomology. And it's quite, it's quite interesting. Um, the, I'm the third urban entomologist, I'm the third, yeah, urban entomologist to get a PhD in the world. The other two are no longer alive, and uh, now there's got to be at least 250, 300 PhDs in, in, in the United States. So if you're looking for more information on this, you can get it from the rat catcher's child, some of this. So uh, in New York City, four of the first six pest control companies had a ferret and a dog, and that's how they did pest control. And they'd let that ferret go and go in the wall and chase out the animal, and the dog would grab it and kill it. And uh, just until a few years ago, there was a company called Ferret Pest Control. And, and the peddlers would sell materials. Now this is the first pest control operator that we recognize in this country. There was nothing recognized at universities or anything at that time. The Rose Exterminating, this was the original one, and he followed Sherman on his march through the south, through Atlanta. And he followed behind him, okay, and did rodent control and sold products and, and so forth after. That's J.J. Davis when he was a young man. I didn't know him then. I knew him, he was in his 70s. And he, he wrote some of the early drawings for the USDA on the life cycle of the Japanese beetle and so forth. And on his own, he decided to go to a convention of pest control operators in Chicago and met with them and convinced them to have a conference at his university. The, he was chairman already. But there were so, some of the other faculty were, how could you do this? How could you let these terrible people? Why are you associating with them? 
And it wasn't, let me tell you, Phil Kaler at the University of Florida, when he started back in 73, they told him don't bother with urban pest management, just do, do the ag. Uh, Snetchinger, when he went to Penn State. So what, the reason why the reason I left here was I could get I could set up an urban entomology program at State University of New York at Farmingdale. Now, this is 1951 in Purdue University. That's the lab in the old building, which is right behind here. And uh, that's Dr. Osman right there. And when I came here, he was still teaching that course, he was head of the department, and I was his assistant in that class. Now, after World War II, some of the students came out to do pest control, uh, uh, take urban entomology, and one of them is right here, is Charlie Ramada. And that's the name of the hall that you have out here, right, in this building, the foyer, okay? So, so he was here to, to start. The very first class, uh, there, there was uh, Bill Brem, he did, invented the B&G sprayer, which is known all over the world. And, uh, and, and so those early people became the pioneers. And Purdue itself became the mecca of urban pest management and then dispersed some students that went and formed other programs at other universities, which is better for the country, but more challenging for you. Because now you're going to have competition, which is healthy, but in, in other places. So Frank Carter came out of World War II, he's 47, I think, he, and he came here. and, and he set up the largest mosquito fogging uh, company east of the Mississippi. Up and down every street, I have a little photograph that actually shows it. Uh, we have enough people. This is from the magazine, 1953. We, uh, we fog communities, we fog everything. And the kids run in it, I think it was like $5 a house, or $3 a house, and you did it. And then, and I used to do that. That too. That's the original B and G sprayer, and that was because there was no sprayer. So John Osmond said, "I'll he challenge them to do that, to make one." And now, uh, there's a big sign I saw. Uh, Rollins, uh, there's an endowed chair. It's going to be here, right? Okay, that's Rollins bought Orkin. Orkin was the first pest control operator to go out and hire salespeople to sell pest control. It was thought of not ethical to try to sell that. And this is Arnold Malice who uh, wrote that huge book by himself which took about 15 of us to rewrite it. And I did one version or two versions and now other people continuing it. Uh, nobody's got the whole book anymore. And this is Norman Borlaug. Now, Norman Borlaug revolutionized urban entomology, but nobody knew it. See, he devo developed genetic modification in agriculture for wheat, so you can have more, and, and the corn, to make higher protein so people could eat that type of food and literally say he won a Nobel Prize in medicine and uh, I shook his hand I didn't want to wash my hand for a week after that I so understanding you know who he was now the other person who has a tremendous impact on urban and you'll see why in urban in a minute is that young lady Rachel Carson who ironically had her house treated for termites with chlordane uh, by harder pest control on Long Island. Uh, so, uh, but she wrote a fiction with some science in it, but made people aware of it. And the f first scientist who 
accepted it and realized what she was doing in our field was John Osmond. And I remember him praising her and say it was a year after and I came here and I, and I didn't like her because she badmouthed my professor in the book and the whole thing. But I found out that that wasn't, you know, so. So uh, that gives you like a encapsulated quick, except there's one other thing I want to show you. And uh, Bill, if uh, my old boss, who I worked for a pest control company for a couple of years, and um, he's 90, going on 93. I'm going to see him in about 10 days. I'm going to try to go down and meet him. That's him, all right? And after World War II, he would buy these machines. That's me. I didn't even know he had this video. This is 1960, I think. And this machine takes a 55 gallon drum of oil and converts it to smoke in less than a minute. And it's to hide a Navy ship. But we're using it for mosquito control. You could buy it anyway. And we'd use any of the malathione or uh, oil. And my job was to drive this truck, okay? With directions that if it stopped, if the machine stopped, get out and run 100 yards because it might blow up. <laughs> and I ran 200 when it did stop, by the way. And so, I, I keep in mind, in those time, everybody was familiar with Atomic Bomb and the Life Magazine, the pictures of what happens. That's what comes out, okay? This is for mosquito control. It, well, it's supposed to go sideways to kill mosquitoes, but if the wind is blowing wrong, it goes like this. And people called in, they thought it was a... Uh, a nuclear bomb that went off. And what was this for? High school graduation. <laughs> All right, this was, the, the graduation was like, maybe gonna be uh, noon, one o'clock. And so we were there at nine in the morning and, okay, you can, you can shot it right there. It shows you, where, that's the best, we never got it down, you know, lower. So who was the guy you're talking about? Al Hockman. Yeah, Al Hockman, 92 Clover Exterminators. He sold his business to J.C. Ehrlich and Victor Hamill took that over, okay? So, but let me tell you something, and I want the students to hear this really loud and clear. My education with that company is as valuable as my PhD is all the years of college. Because when you get out to work, if you don't know what you're doing, you have no background, people don't have patience for you. And you have to take that experience and work with it. I, Dr. Bennett's father was a pest control operator in Louisiana, right? Uh, discovered the Formosan termite, as I, as I recall. Okay? And that's one of the unique things about Purdue. And in a school of agriculture, you hire people who have some background. All right, now when you get out of school, you say, how do I get experience if I'm getting out of school? Because you waited too long. You waited till you got out. You have to ride with a technician. Now, I don't care if you're in veg crops, ride with a technician. And every discipline, flip flop over. Uh, let me tell you, my, f my first consulting job, before I left uh, teaching in, the, in 1967, uh, Florida Power and Electric, which was called something else at that time, uh, they called me in and they got mud daubers, and they showed me we gotta get rid of these mud daubers. So I tell them with all my experience, PhD, they're beneficial. They say, well, they blew up a house. I said, that's got to be like unbelievably rare. Unbelievably rare. So this has happened three times. Six, two, six people dead. I'm standing there looking. I never learned that. That's totally contradicted what I know. So then I said, well, I can't stand like I'm stupid here. You know, I got, okay, let me hear it. And he explained. And I solved it in two minutes. They put a cap over the end where the gas comes out, the backup, and it's perfect 
for them to build their mud tubes. So they did it and they plugged it and it built up. So you, you gotta cut it off. Okay, you gotta cut it off. I says, and you put a little screen, but make it so they, you know, the air can still go through. Uh, he says, I said to him, how many houses do you have like this? He says, over 300,000. Now, in English it's called balls, in Yiddish it's called chutzpah. I'm 27 years old. I tell him, cut them all off. PhD, Dari, I, I, I did it, okay? And it worked. Not a single house has blown up since that time. So somebody asked me today at the students, what's the most gratifying you ever did? And I said, helping people, right? That was, that was my answer. Now the second consulting job I went on was a, a Trogoderma, government, USDA, closed the building, that's a grain pest. Standard brands are out of business now in that area, so I could say it, Hoboken, New Jersey. And they're closed, and I'm driving over there thinking, Boy, I hope I know more about this one than the other one. And I get there, and they got people looking for the Beatles, and they can't find them. And I reach down, and I pick up a piece of paper crumpled up, and I put it on, and I show them three Beatles in it. And he says to me, how do you, how do you know that? I said, well, Trogoderma, Kappa beetle is, means brick, and they hide in cracks. Trogoderma hide in cracks. I learned that in school, see? But... I learned where they hide from Art Muca at Cornell when I was in the livestock entomology and he was in the hallway one day and he said to me, hey Austin, you want to take a ride to Troy, New York? Which was, I don't know, four and a half hours or something. I'll just, just I said, why not? Trogoderma problem. Can you imagine that? My second consulting job was from a job when I was a livestock entomology and I went with another professor. I work with a zoo in Minnesota in a parasitic wasp and go. I work with Pimentel as an undergrad, a freshman. Uh, he was a bio, uh, biological control and he showed me and taught me all kinds of things on that. And to this day, I'm still learning. I'll go home. In a couple days, my wife will say, how did it go? And I'll tell her, I learned so much. She'll say, again, you learned so much? I thought you did the talking. No, I said, I did the listening, too. You see, because I'm going to listen to people. Mike took me around and showed me a couple things today. I got to smell those roaches that I used to take years ago. And oh, boy, that was, that was something else. OK, now. Um, I thought I would take a little bit of time and give you uh, some interesting jobs that I did. They're not the most gross or anything like that that somebody asked me today. But, uh, one of them was uh, I had to go in a gorilla cage. Now, why do I have to go in a gorilla cage? Um, Blanton Whitmire from, which is now BASF, they gave me a small grant to study cockroaches and see if they carry bacteria. And I, I had to go to different situations. And so I was doing some work with Bush Gardens, and I said, boy, it would be interesting to get in there. So, so I flew down there, and they put me in a cage with this big gorilla, and they, they held them off with a power hose, and they, I ran around, and I grabbed the roaches, and I ran them on the plates, and then I, it was in the summer, and I took them back up to New York, and I gave them to the microbiologist, and he says, this is worthless. The fungus grew all over it. I can't tell anymore. Took, he says, just collect the roaches and we'll run the plates here. I got to go back. Gorilla has a memory. <laughs> this time, they put that hose against them. They got them against the wall and I'm collecting. I didn't know a gorilla could move that fast. I, I hear the guy with the hose yell, whoa! And I turn around and the gorilla had jumped like this and got away from the hose. And he's coming at me and I, I got to get one more roach. Put your, Boom, and I just got out, the door slammed and gorilla snot on the back of my neck. On a, and uh, both Bobby Corrigan and I at different times have done the Madison Square Garden. Uh, <coughs> I did it for the Democrats, he did it for the Republican Party. But they have the zoo there, a circus, and I remember how to go between two rhinos. And they're pretty placid, but I, we had to push them 
to get in between and never stand behind a hippo. That's a different story, I want to tell you. I've been in the UN and the Secretary General's office while the Falcon Islands were being attacked by Argentina. Uh, I'd collect something there. Uh, then uh, may rest in peace Glenn Laker, who was an entomologist here, the first summer I'm here. I had to collect water from the Kankakee River, 40 gallons every 10 days, <laughs> and two gallons of mud. And to get, in order to get this mud, I had to get it from the center of the river. So I, he sent me over a railroad spur. He said, they don't use that anymore. Go, go there and then hang and put your scoop down and scoop up and pull it up. So I, it's a long bridge there too. So I'm there and I'm scooping and there's a train. I see a train coming. I said, ah, Professor Laker said it don't come here. It's going to turn off just before. It didn't. And I had to get down on the trestle and hold on like this. And in Indiana, they're not 10 car train, you know, it's like 100 cars. It was unbelievable. And I think I was half shaking from being afraid, but also was shaking. Well, I get back and I tell him, I said, Professor Laker, that train, and coming from New York, I talk fast. That train was coming, came right across. He goes, well, I'll be darned. That's what he said. And I did uh, that. Uh, now, one, one interesting job that I had was a, the, a Pan Am building, which they don't have the helicopter there anymore, but the, the, and Pan Am isn't there anymore. The airline, they're out of business. But a roach got into the computer and dropped the whole thing. So all the airlines around the world are shut down. They're shut down. And I get this call at night to get, I live 30 miles from there. Uh, we're going to bring a helicopter out and bring you in and put you right on a building and come in. So I said, well, I got to get to where well, the helicopter is like 15 minutes away. And now I said, just get the tunnel open for me. Hold the Midtown Tunnel open. And, and they did. And, and I went right through and I didn't have to park. Not like on this campus where you can't park, but anyway, I, I left the car, went up, and uh, they already had engineers and the whole thing, and I said, okay, you know, this roach, and, but there's four things that I learned in my field that you have to know. What is it? Why is it here? How do I get rid of it ASAP? And then the most important question, how do you keep it from coming back? That's what they're paying me for. They know it's a roach, all right? The problem was they were bringing food into the room and they had live plants in the room. Now, you're an entomologist, duh, right? But to the rest of the world, you're kidding me, right? That, that's, you know, taking what you know and then applying it to that, to that area. All right, now, I'm going to talk about new technology and our challenges. And I just picked a couple. Uh, my son's in solar energy. He develops uh, um, designs for solar panels on roofs of buildings in Manhattan. Uh, big jobs, like five apartment buildings taking up two square blocks, okay? That, that, that type of thing. So he comes to me one day and he says, Dad, I got a problem. What's the problem? We got squirrels. They're getting up on the buildings and uh, they're chewing on the wires and knocking them off. So uh, these are five-story high buildings. So I, I, I talked about netting and some other stuff and and then a little bit about trimming the branches and all that. And now I'm looking for different repellents. But it's not in the books. There's no, how do you keep squirrels from chewing on solar panel electrical boxes? Like, you know what I mean? Without getting the people upset that you're hurting the squirrel. So. Now, the next thing that's happened is uh, 
Well, let me, I'll give you a quiz. What mayor wants his city to be the healthiest city in the United States? Bloomberg? Yes, Mayor Bloomberg, New York City. So he just banned uh, big sodas. They said he can't do that. But before he was mayor, they made a decree in the city. This goes back around 1960, somewhere around there. He, they looked over New York City and said, thou shalt not burn garbage in incinerators anymore because it pollutes the air. But what do you do with the garbage? You throw it down the same chute and you compact it, right? And the cockroaches said, yeah, right? And the mice said, yeah. And there's tens of millions of cockroaches living in these incinerator chutes. And if 200 apartments are clean and one guy's got roaches and he throws it in the chute in the car, guess what? Right? So, that, you make an environmental law and now you have a new urban pest management challenge. Uh, the, the state tree in Florida is the cabbage palm tree. So they build this building in Orlando with UV light that reflects off the building, which attracts the cabbage palm moth. So what do you want me to do? Take all the, all the lights off the windows out of the building? That's the whole building. You want me to cut down the trees? That's the state tree. Okay. You have to come up with program. John Hancock building sucked carpenter ants from a mile around to the top of the building, tens of thousands, because of the design of the building. It's uh, written up, uh, Dick Berman wrote it up on, from Waltham Chemical. Uh, the next one is a burn center, a flushing, uh, flushing New York. I won't give you the name of the hospital, but uh, I'm coming home from Hartford, tired. Uh, we left at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. It's now like 5.30. Not getting dark yet, but almost. Get a call. All right, Austin, you got to come here to such such hospital. Uh, it's a burn center. And I said, well, uh, uh, tomorrow morning. I got, no, I, there's about 30 patients and there's flies all over them and they're screaming in pain right now. Whoa. Okay, okay. I say, uh, you got glue boards with you? He says, yeah, I got a truck, I got a case. I said, get them all ready, get them up there. He says, Austin, it's not mice, it's flies. I said, don't question me, just get them up there. And I said, and go to the kitchen and get vinegar and they get me about four nurses. So I get up there and I tell them, okay, quick, boom. And, and I put the vinegar on the boards and we just take uh, like a towel. The nurses go like this so they don't touch the patient, but it blows the flies off of them onto the boards, okay? Clean up almost 98% of the flies within 10 minutes. Wow! Big John Gongolowski, the pest control operator, says to me, now nah, we can go home. I says, no, we can't. What is it? How do we get rid of it? Why is it here? How do we get rid of this problem? How do you keep it from coming back? Tomorrow morning, you're gonna have just as many flies. What happened? What's different? We don't know. Into the room, we get a, not a fancy room like this, but a room with a thing. We get nursing, housekeeping, um, um, engineering. We start Four o'clock in the morning, four to five, what'd you do different? Nothing, five to six, da -da. we get eight, eight thirty in the morning. An outside company came in and cut in the basement a chute that hadn't been used in years. And illegally, they were throwing human tissue from surgery down that chute, and it was all plugged up. So now they had to clean the whole thing out for that. And then I went home, and then my wife would say something like, you're a little late. You know, what happened? I said, well, I had to, you always have to, but you did. 
because uh, you know of, of those type of things. Uh, now, one of the things that's coming in a technology is zone pest control. Instead of controlling termites on a single basis of a single house, and they're starting these on islands to start with, to take 200 homes and see if they can protect that whole area. Now environmentally I question it because you're now making everything there termite free unless wind blows them in or something. But uh, they're looking at the cost for individual house versus that. Another thing they're doing, and Art Appel, who's at Auburn uh, University, came up with this probably 20 years ago, but a good idea takes about 30 to 40 before people catch on. And what he, he built a model, and I'll simplify it for you. Here's a house that has pine trees around it, and here's a house that has oak trees around it. We know that peri-domestic cockroaches, the smoky browns, the, the brown roach, American roaches, live in tree holes. The chance of getting those kind of roaches in that house is much greater here than it is there. Follow? So he then takes numbers to build a formula for that house. And you Google and you take that house and you put everything on it and then you can predict what pests will come. Type of mulch, et cetera. And then you can tailor make a program for that community or that house, which is pretty neat. And you use the computers and you, you develop that whole, that whole program. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. It's hard to get people excited though about things initially. So I'll, uh, uh, Mike, I know you stayed outside because you're allergic to the roaches, but uh, let's see. Jesse. Russell? Jesse? Yeah, yeah. Jack, Jack, Jesse. Uh, now, I didn't steal one from you. You had one of these, right? You had this sitting up there in a to catch roaches. And for you, everybody looks at it, that's, yeah, well, it's pretty neat, right? No pesticide, all right. 40 something years ago, 45 years ago, this was being sold in stores over the counter called Mr. Sticky. Pulled it back, same thing. Three for a dollar. I found it in Fort Apache. It's a housing authority in a really tough area. Full of roaches. Never saw it before in my life. I had my PhD ready. Put it. Asked the lady if I could have it. She says, no, you go buy your own. I said, but it's full of roaches. She said, I don't care. You leave it right there. Left it there. Bought my own. Looked at it. I said, this is great for research. And I did. I would go out. I was testing different products and so forth. And then I went to an entomological society meeting where the geniuses were, the professors. And I showed it. And you know what answer I got? Now, we use boiled raisins and we put it in a jar in the corner of the room. I said, but I'm telling you, you can put this in more spots and do. Now, so I said, okay, I'll go to a brighter group. I'll go to the pest control industry at Purdue University. I show it to them. You know what I say? What do we need this for? This is just extra money. We gotta kill them. What good is this? Because I said it doesn't eliminate. Waste. And then I went to a company called Bell Environmental. And I gave a little seminar. I had about 10 men. He's in the back of the room. And he looks up. And he never listened. It didn't seem like he was ever listening when I talked, you know. I'm gonna make millions. I had no idea what he was that, not what he's talking about. He did. He made tens of millions with this for the pharmaceutical industry. Put his company name on him, sold him. And just today, ironically, uh, Steve Yannick's secretary told me she got a call from a Phil Waldorf, uh, from Glenn Waldorf, that's his son, who wants to hire 
an entomologist who's graduating or been out for a few years for that company. They have one now. They had a second one, a young lady, and she went to work for Univor. And that is a really good company to work for. And uh, they're in New Jersey in Parsippany, far enough away from the city that you don't have to live there, uh, close enough if you want to go there that you can. So what goes around comes around. Now, a visionary is a pioneer and an actionary is somebody who leaves a positive footprint so of progress so you can benefit. So the question I'm going to throw out to you is who's going to become a visionary here? I don't know. It's up, in, it's, it's, it's up to you in your mind. When I was a kid in the probably seventh grade, my cousin graduated high school and the high school person, uh, the speaker, gave a talk and he had a jar and he had a bunch of peanuts in it and, f and walnuts and he put the walnuts inside and he said the peanuts always complain because the walnuts are on top. So I pu he pushed the walnuts in and he shook it up he says, but the walnuts always come to the top. Now I'm in seventh grade. I don't remember the guy's name. And I said to my cousin who was sitting next to me, I'm going to be a walnut. I'm going to be a walnut. <laughs> Look at me, you know what the heck I was talking about. All right, now, 58, last year, how many years is 58 to now? That's uh, 55 years? Yeah, so 54 years later, I was invited to be the keynote speaker at that high school and gave that same, because I know nobody was alive that would remember that thing, and, and challenge them to that, to that very, to that very thing. Um, so this, this is I now put together what I have: advice for the students, and then I have another advice for the uh, faculty. First piece of advice I got to you is go through life with passion, and keep. A little bit of your childness in you. Never grow up. Always want to be a kid somewhere. Uh, ben Hodel is a PhD student in the uh, University of Florida and I happened to be at a bed bug symposium to learn for two days. Took off just to learn. Never stop learning. And at the break, he grabs his butterfly net, runs out, PhD student, collects, puts him in, all excited, you know, South Florida, we don't get the things that we get in Gainesville. And so, and I said, Ben, and I taught his mother, I said, don't ever lose that little childhood in you. Uh, then get out in a field, ride like a pest control operator, I told you, and where it really hit home when I graduated with my PhD, there's a famous entomologist, he's probably retired now, from Purdue, graduated, named Larry Pinto. He went to University of Iowa. And he didn't like urban entomologists. We were separated. This professor had this group, this one had this group. And all of a sudden, he got this job there where he had to have some of that. And he was scrambling the last four months trying to learn as much as he could from that. So my advice to students is learn what the other fields are doing. You're not interested in ge genetic molecular, I don't care, learn, okay? You're not interested in veg crops, learn. Another thing you want to do, take a piece of paper and get the name of every student here and where you can reach them with an address, the phone numbers, make up a big sheet. You have 30 students for it, and do that every semester because it changes. And what that's for is five years from now when you're out of here and you're looking for a job, you say, I wonder where such and such is. And you can go back and find out. I, I've got, I haven't taught since 1980. I've got students, former students, that are still doing that, connecting with each other year by year. I have each ditto sheet and so forth. And uh, because it's a lot of it is not just what you know, but who you know. So, and Gary Bennett's really good in the urban end part where he, he, he has connections in industry. Um, the next thing 
is plan to give back to your community, your university, if your church or synagogue, but you owe it. You owe it back. You're select. You, you are the privileged who got the education. You know how many millions of kids are as bright as you, but can't go to school? They cannot go. They just, they lost their parents when they were little. They got two younger brothers. They got to go to work. They got to take care. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a, it's a fact. Uh, then, if you're not particularly fond of a, uh, of a required course, hit it hard, do well. The grade you live with forever, the professor only one semester. I had a guy, uh, ecology, he hated me. And do you know why he hated me? I don't really want to tell you. I was a two-headed student. I had a PhD in urban entomology and ecology. They didn't talk to each other. This was not good. And I was taking his ecology course. And he found out I was the secretary treasurer of the Indiana Pest Control Association, because I, to make a living while I was here, I did that, and that pesticides, and he didn't like that. So he went after me. And it, it was not good. Four courses I had to take with him. What was his name? Uh, we called him Black Al. He, 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 he was a little nuts and Osmond didn't like him either. Uh, but uh, you know what happened? There was a tree worth $20,000 sitting on top of a hill with his a lightning belt going through. And he says, the farmer who owns this will not have them cut this tree. What do you think of that? We're on a field trip. I thought he wanted a bright answer. So I raised my hand. I said, I think he's nuts. Cut the tree, take 20 grand, put 10 in the bank, and take the other 10 and replant more trees. Because it's going to go with lightning. His face got red. Eyes in trouble. <laughs> All right, next thing is you got to question your professors. They tell you something, may not be true. They may not even know it's not true. So here's what I used to do, the first quiz for my medical entomology students. I had a bulletin board, I had things up on there, and I said, you get a quiz at the end of the week, and at least two questions are coming from that bulletin board, and boy, they were in everything. And I said, everything I save, like specimens, and so you can argue if it's different. I save this stuff from the bulletin board. So I asked them, how do you, how do you identify the poisonous spit spider? So they all write down, you turn it over, and you look at it, but it spits and you die. They write that down. I mark it off, mark it off, mark it off. They come in as a group. Oh, no way, it's true. So, okay, we get the stuff out, they take it out, and they look at it, and they go, right there. I said, that's from Mad Magazine. That's a joke. Well, if it's in print, it means it's so. I no, I said, it doesn't. That's the thing you have to question. So when I was asked to develop a material, a bait for cockroaches, it had never been done before for German cockroaches. I could have said, right? No. But my crayon was up here. Up. Got it? Why not? Let's try it. And with the technology that's available today, to, wow, the systems that you have, that's just amazing. And some of the challenges we have is new invading species, uh, new ones coming up all the time. The cost to develop pesticides on a global basis, the government regulations, and the forces, the challenges, agriculture, and there we go back to Norman Borlaug, and public health are moving away from conventional pesticides. They're going to genetic modification. So there's not enough money to make selling it in urban entomology. So then you've got to have other, uh, other approaches to it. And, and, and that is a big, big driving force. So you say though, okay, 
Uh, why should they do that? Well, let me give you an example. A child dies every 30 seconds in Africa from malaria. Every 30 seconds. Dengue, there's 16 million cases in 2010. They thought there's going to be somewhere between 50 and 100 million cases this past year. The data just in, it was in yesterday's newspaper. More than 390 million cases of dengue. And the Caribbean is where a lot of it is popping up now where people from Puerto Rico and Nassau and so forth come to the United States and I live in Florida and where it's, it's coming. And Lyme disease, of course, is a big one. Another big challenge that we have here is the moral issue. How do we reach the poor to, to do pest control? And I'm talking not just urban, I'm talking to eat. The wealthiest have the most and the most money is spent here. And, and hopefully some of you will dedicate something in that area. Uh, farms are gonna come indoors. We're gonna have buildings and grow rice and all that. And all agriculture is gonna be urban. We're gonna have cows on treadmills. It's pretty neat. No, they don't laugh, okay? They laughed when I showed the sticky trap. They laughed when I showed the max force. This is a snap trap. On a snap trap, there's an electronic thing. That electronic thing, wireless, goes to the wall and then rings in four different cell phones or wherever you want it, and it tells you what you caught. And it's being used now for trapping bears and all that, but for rats in apartments and so forth. Pretty neat. Star Wars, but it's here. And now they're gonna photograph it. But one of the challenges, I don't know if this is well, let me, coming off, is how you're going to kill. This kills humanely mice. That doesn't kill humanely. The wood is biosustainable wood, otherwise Walmart won't carry it. Those are some of the challenges that, that we have with Peter coming. Like this, this has just been banned in colleges in Vermont or New Hampshire. And more and more, you're going to see that. It's recycled. It's not. It's getting in the waste. These are going to, I don't, I don't care what it is. Toilet paper's on the way out. You can laugh now, but I'll, I don't have time to explain to you, but it's on the way out. Um, education. This is going to be for the professors here. If you've only got three years left, don't worry. If you've got more than three years left, your courses, the majority of people will be taking courses from work. They don't want a degree. They want the knowledge. They want to go online. Right here, CEUs enter the space age. Now, Purdue is the first to have a correspondence course, but it's way beyond that now. And the associations, each group, they're doing this. Uh, I think they call it MOOC. S. Uh, you're going to get Harvard is going to be given lots of courses and then you'll you won't get a degree you'll get these courses from there and the industry will pump money in to the universities or to where it is just to develop that that area now I only got like three minutes left so my advice to the faculty uh, number one Try to get grant money <coughs> from where you normally think of it. An example, a fellow at Cornell got grant money from a telephone company for carpenter ant research. Because the carpenter ants were knocking down the pole, you know, the wind blows them and they chew on the bottom. That fellow who got that grant wasn't an entomologist. But he had colonies of carpenter ants going. So think beyond the Dow's and the BASF's and the USDA and that type of thing. Then be careful to put too much of your grant money from one source. That's like all your eggs in one basket. And it could go like that tomorrow. Learn from your former students and critique your own teaching. At the end of each semester, ask your students what was the worst lecture I gave? 
have them put it in a sealed envelope. The grades are submitted. You don't open it until then. And then you sit there and you read it. They'll be very truthful to you. Say, what was my best, what was my worst? And then you work on that worst one and fix it. And then you do it again, and then you do it again. Now I'm gonna tell you who taught me that. The greatest coach in basketball that ever lived and won 10 championships. What was his name? John Wooden. John Wooden. And where did John Wooden graduate from? Purdue, All-American. And he, Purdue waited too long to hire him, so he gave his word to UCLA and he went there. Otherwise, he would have come here. He would take his basketball students and had a book on each one and work on one thing at a time with them until they were seniors and the best for the playoffs. And it started with how you put your socks on and off. It was a wild, wild you know, type of thing. So I would do that with my students because the extension and the research is good, but the most valuable thing you have as faculty is the students. That's what you leave for the world, you know, to go on. And so I didn't come here to talk about my specific research that I did or things like that. I, I did it more to get you to think and more with an open mind. Uh, I brought this with me, and I'm going to leave this. Where did he go? I can't find it. There he is. Okay, yeah. Uh, Bobby Corrigan came up with the idea of taking an entire park and lifting all the grass and putting this in, and then put the grass back so rats can't go in it. There's a slave cemetery of a couple acres in New York City. Works. It's unbelievable. He went beyond Purdue. He went beyond what I taught him. He, see? So I'm not concerned about retiring. I've left this world in a better place than I came. And that's your goal in life, too. Thank you, and I will entertain any questions. <laughs>